angel is saying to you, Victory is coming to your household. Victory is coming in your finances. Victory is coming in your health. You are healthy and blessed. You are prosperous, successful, and loved. You are growing and you are winning. Expect good news today. Expect new opportunities today. Expect healing today. Expect breakthroughs today. I declare God is making a way for you right now. You're stepping into a season where things change for the better. You're about to receive and experience unprecedented favor, miracles, and breakthroughs in every area of your life. You've never been blessed on the level that God is about to bless you. Prepare yourself. God is saying to you today, you passed the test. You just graduated to the next level. You're going up. In case no one told you today, you are beautiful. You are loved. You are stronger than you think. Your life is valuable. You have so much ahead of you. You are not a mistake. You are important. I declare, something you prayed about is moving closer to you. Get ready and start packing. God is about to put keys right in your hand. Claim it. Something good is going to happen today. Healing is going to happen. Prayers are going to be answered. New opportunities and doors are going to open. Today will be big. In Jesus' name. Amen, Lord. It is by your gift that evening follows day and that rest restores us after labor. While we rejoice to receive these blessings, make us mindful that they come from your gracious hand. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Holy God, your knowledge of me exceeds what I grasp or see at any moment. You know me better than I know myself. Now, help me to trust in your mercy and love. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Lord, in moments of weariness and doubt, I turn to you, the ultimate source of strength and inspiration. Grant me the motivation to face challenges with resilience and perseverance. May your divine energy infuse my spirit, guiding me through moments of uncertainty and fueling my determination to pursue my goals. Illuminate the path ahead, reminding me that with you, all things are possible. Let your presence be a constant source of motivation, inspiring me to strive for excellence and contribute positively to the world around me. In moments of weakness, uplift my spirit and renew my motivation with your unwavering grace. Amen. Almighty and everlasting God, I have set many goals for myself. I want to achieve academic greatness and success. I know this goal will not fulfill itself overnight. It will take hard work, determination, and a fixation on your greatness and support. Please prepare for this lifelong journey towards academic success. Lift me from my failures and celebrate me in my victories. Excite my mind for knowledge. Please join me on this path towards success. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Your time is limited, so don't waste it living someone else's life. Don't be trapped by dogma, which is living with the results of other people's thinking. Don't let the noise of others' opinions drown out your own inner voice. And most important, have the courage to follow your heart and intuition. People are often unreasonable and self-centered. Forgive them anyway. If you are kind, people may accuse you of ulterior motives. Be kind anyway. If you are successful, you will win some false friends and some true enemies succeed anyway. What you spend years building someone can destroy. Overnight, build anyway. If you are honest, people may cheat you. Honest anyway. Be if you find happiness, people may be jealous. Be happy anyway. The good you do today may be forgotten tomorrow. 
Do good anyway. Give the world the best you have and it may never be enough. Give your best anyway. For you see, in the end, it is between you and God. It was never between you and them anyway. Many of us suffer from the unbalanced tendency to be ready only out of season. The season does not refer to time, it refers to us. This verse says, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season. In other words, we should be ready whether we feel like it or not. If we do only what we feel inclined to do, some of us would never do anything. There are some people who are totally unemployable in the spiritual realm. They are spiritually feeble and weak, and they refuse to do anything unless they are supernaturally inspired. The proof that our relationship is right with God is that we do our best whether we feel inspired or not. One of the worst traps a Christian worker can fall into is to become obsessed with his own exceptional moments of inspiration. When the Spirit of God gives you a time of inspiration and insight, you tend to say, Now that I've experienced this moment, I will always be like this for God. No, you will not, and God will make sure of that. Those times are entirely the gift of God. You cannot give them to yourself when you choose. If you say you will only be at your best for God, as during those exceptional times, you actually become an intolerance burden on Him. You will never do anything unless God keeps you consciously aware of His inspiration to you at all times. If you make a God out of your best moments, you will find that God will fade out of your life never to return until you are obedient in the work he has placed closest to you, and until you have learned not to be obsessed with those exceptional moments he has given you. A person's character determines how he interprets God's will. See Psalm 18, 25, 26. Abraham interpreted God's command to mean that he had to kill his son, and he could only leave this traditional belief behind through the pain of a tremendous ordeal. God could purify his faith in no other way. If we obey what God says according to our sincere belief, God will break us from those traditional beliefs that misrepresent him. There are many such beliefs which must be removed. For example, that God removes a child because his mother loves him too much. That is the devil's lie and a travesty on the true nature of God. If the devil can hinder us from taking the supreme climb and getting rid of our wrong traditional beliefs about God, he will do so. But if we will stay true to God, God will take us through an ordeal that will serve to bring us into a better knowledge of himself. The great lesson to be learned from Abraham's faith in God is that he was prepared to do anything for God. He was there to obey God, no matter what contrary belief of his might be violated by his obedience. Abraham was not devoted to his own convictions, or else he would have slain Isaac and said that the voice of the angel was actually the voice of the devil. That is the attitude of a fanatic. If you will remain true to God, God will lead you directly through every barrier and right into the inner chamber of the knowledge of himself. But you must always be willing to come to the point of giving up your own convictions and traditional beliefs. Don't ask God to test you. Never declare as Peter did that you are willing to do anything, even to go both to prison and to death, Luke 22, 33. Abraham did not make any such statement. He simply remained true to God, and God purified his faith. Our Lord was not referring here to a cost which we have to count, but to a cost which he has already counted. The cost was those thirty years in Nazareth, those three years of popularity, scandal and hatred, the unfathomable agony he experienced in Gethsemane, and the assault upon him at Calvary, 
the central point upon which all of time and eternity turn. Jesus Christ has counted the cost. In the final analysis, people are not going to laugh at him and say, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Luke 14.30 The conditions of discipleship given to us by our Lord in verses 26, 27, and 33 mean that the men and women he is going to use in his mighty building enterprises are those in whom he has done everything. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. 1426 this verse teaches us that the only men and women our Lord will use in His building enterprises are those who love Him personally, passionately, and with great devotions, those who have a love for Him that goes far beyond any of the closest relationships on earth. The conditions are strict, but they are glorious. All that we build is going to be inspected by God. When God inspects us with His searching and refining fire, will He detect that we have built enterprises of our own on the foundation of Jesus? See 1 Corinthians 3.10.15 We are living in a time of tremendous enterprises, a time when we are trying to work for God, and that is where the trap is. Profoundly speaking, we can never work for God. Jesus, as the master builder, takes us over so that he may direct and control us completely for his enterprises and his building plans, and no one has any right to demand where he will be put to work. Perseverance means more than endurance, more than simply holding on until the end. A saint's life is in the hands of God like a bow and arrow in the hands of an archer. God is aiming at something the saint cannot see, but our Lord continues to stretch and strain, and every once in a while the saint says, I can't take any more. Yet God pays no attention. He goes on stretching until his purpose is in sight, and then he lets the arrow fly. Entrust yourself to God's hands. Is there something in your life for which you need perseverance right now? Maintain your intimate relationship with Jesus Christ through the perseverance of faith. Proclaim as Job did, Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Job 13.15 Faith is not some weak and pitiful emotion, but is strong and vigorous confidence built on the fact that God is holy love. And even though you cannot see him right now and cannot understand what he is doing, you know him. Disaster occurs in your life when you lack the mental composure that comes from establishing yourself on the eternal truth that God is holy love. Faith is the supreme effort of your life throwing yourself with abandon and total confidence upon God. God ventured his all in Jesus Christ to save us, and now he wants us to venture our all with total abandoned confidence in him. There are areas in our lives where that faith has not worked in us as yet, places still untouched by the life of God. There were none of those places in Jesus Christ's life, and there are to be none in ours. Jesus prayed, This is eternal life, that they may know you. John 17, 3 The real meaning of eternal life is a life that can face anything it has to face without wavering. If we take this view, life will become one great romance, a glorious opportunity of seeing wonderful things all the time. God is disciplining us to get us into this central place of power. There is a difference between holding on to a principle and having a vision. A principle does not come from moral inspiration, but a vision does. People who are totally consumed with idealistic principles rarely do anything. A person's own idea of God and his attributes may actually be used to justify and rationalize his deliberate neglect of his duty. 
Jonah tried to excuse his disobedience by saying to God, I know that you are a gracious and merciful God, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness, one who relents from doing harm. Jonah 4.2 I too may have the right idea of God and his attributes, but that may be the very reason why I do not do my duty. But wherever there is vision, there is also a life of honesty and integrity, because the vision gives me the moral incentive. Our own idealistic principles may actually lull us into ruin. Examine yourself spiritually to see if you have vision, or only principles. Ah, but a man's reach should exceed his grasp, or what's a heaven for? Where there is no revelation or prophetic vision, once we lose sight of God, we begin to be reckless. We cast off certain restraints from activities we know are wrong. We set prayer aside as well and cease having God's vision in the little things of life. We simply begin to act on our own initiative. If we are eating only out of our own hand and doing things solely on our own initiative without expecting God to come in, we are on a downward path. We have lost our vision. Is our attitude today an attitude that flows from our vision of God? Are we expecting God to do greater things than He has ever done before? Is there a freshness and a vitality in our spiritual outlook? Add means that we have to do something. We are in danger of forgetting that we cannot do what God does and that God will not do what we can do. We cannot save nor sanctify ourselves, God does that. But God will not give us good habits or character, and He will not force us to walk correctly before Him. We have to do all that ourselves. We must work out our own salvation, which God has worked in us. Philippians 2.12 Add means that we must get into the habit of doing things, and in the initial stages that is difficult. To take the initiative is to make a beginning to yourself in the way you must go. Beware of the tendency to ask the way when you know it perfectly well. Take the initiative, stop hesitating, and take the first step. Be determined to act immediately in faith on what God says to you when He speaks, and never reconsider or change your initial decisions. If you hesitate when God tells you to do something, you are being careless, spurning the grace in which you stand. Take the initiative yourself, make a decision of your will right now, and make it impossible to go back. Burn your bridges behind you, saying, I will write that letter, or I will pay that debt, and then do it. Make it irrevocable. We have to get into the habit of carefully listening to God about everything, forming the habit of finding out what He says and heeding it. If, when a crisis comes, we instinctively turn to God, we will know that the habit has been formed in us. We have to take the initiative where we are, not where we have not yet been. Subscribe to our channel to help us reach 2,000 subscribers. Share this video to your loved ones. Donate us. Super thanks to support us. Type Amen to affirm. Thanks for watching.